Good day, and welcome to another one of our Answers Weekly Wraps. I'm Bob Govender, and as usual, what we'll do is we'll cover some stories of the week that affect you in your investments going forward, and do a bit of a wrap-up with the AI slash tech segment at the end. Our three stories this week are going to be as follows. Uh, the weakening round, uh, oil prices fluctuating dramatically, and then finally do a little deep dive into the current turmoil in the U.S. political system and how it might affect you. And in our AI segment, we discuss uh, the new uh, add-ons to GPT-4, uh, including the ability to see things, uh, which have had incredible uh, you know, applications just appear recently. Okay, let's start off with uh, the currencies. So we have seen the rod weaken dramatically over the last uh, few days. Uh, as I speak to you, we just under 1960 to the US dollar, 1960 to the US dollar. I mean, we were sitting at, you know, 18 some change you know, last week or so. Uh, so it's been quite a dramatic, you know, weakening coming through. And this is not the only currency in South Africa. We saw the yen breach 150 yen to the US dollar. We saw the Naira uh, fall a bit. I mean, uh, it was, uh, the unofficial rate broke, went above a thousand. The official rate is in the 700s, but the unofficial rate, the black market rate went over a thousand. The dollar has strengthened significantly over the last little while. And there's a number of reasons for this. I think one of the more important reasons is that though we are often focused on the issues in the U.S. economy, it remains the strongest developing market economy by far. There's nothing close to it. Um, you know, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, of course, uh, to some extent, uh, it's a little exception, and if, uh, the U.K. Uh, you know, there's, there's really nothing that compares to the vibrancy and the strength of the U.S. economy. Nothing compares to basically stability and protection from things like, for instance, uh, you know, energy crises, which are going to be a big issue again. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, you know, these things are are really, really uh, something the U.S. does not have to worry about that much. At the same time, no, uh, the U.S. basically has some issues with its uh, debt, etc. Uh, understand that that's not going to be a, a much worse uh, a thing that means a U.S. problem. A problem with U.S. debt becomes a global problem, like the financial crisis we have started in the U.S. Uh, housing market, but spread around the world. Uh, it's not something that the U.S. is particularly, uh, you know, unique in terms of being affected by. So they have fewer downsides uh, than their, uh, you know, other countries, uh, comparable countries out there, and therefore we see the dollar strength is quite significantly over the last week or so. Uh, it remains to be seen whether or not this will continue. Uh, another thing that, that obviously is going to affect things is obviously interest rates, and we have seen interest rate uh, expectations significantly rise in the U.S. at the moment. Uh, we saw in the ten-year breach of you know 4.6 percent, which is obviously a very very key level, 4.5 percent, 4.6 percent. It's it's we're talking about a significant uh, debt burden that the U.S. is being facing over the next little while. And why is this important? It's important because the U.S. is about 33 billion, uh, 33 trillion. Dollars. That's thirty-three thousand billion dollars worth of debt, or thirty-three million million dollars of debt. How are you going to think of it? That makes your mind be blown by the size of the amount of debt they're talking about. And when you have a four and a half percent, you know, to the interest rate, that means if that debt eventually gets rolled over at four and a half percent, you're talking about a significant, you know, interest servicing payment somewhere in the region of about one and a half trillion dollars almost. Uh, that's a huge amount of money. Even for a country like the U.S., the U.S. has about $23, $24 trillion in GDP. This is well in excess of 5 6% of U.S. GDP in total. This is a significant number of, uh, you know, uh, of money that's just going to be paid to basically bondholders. Uh, and that's a problem, I think, uh, that, uh, you know, is a big problem for the U.S. But that being said, you look at the Europe, uh, you look at Japan, you look at, uh, you know, the U.K., and unfortunately, those places look worse. So yeah, uh, the U.S. has problems, but nothing uh, that makes them worse. In fact, in many cases, they may have problems, but those problems are much better, or, uh, or much less severe than some of the major competitors. The next thing is we're going to talk about the oil price. The oil price has fluctuated dramatically over the last two weeks. I mean, we're talking about 95, 96 at the high, and 85, uh, as I speak to you right now. Uh, we're talking about an excess of a 10% move in terms of oil prices. Now, why is this important? Well, inflation has returned quite significantly over the last little while, uh, and obviously oil prices do affect that. When we saw 95, 96, that's obviously putting a lot of pressure on, uh, you know, uh, consumers. The fact that we've dropped to 85 in a couple of days, uh, hopefully, uh, removes some of these pressures. In South Africa, we saw petrol prices rise yet again by more than one round. It was last week month by more than one round. It was again this month by more than one round. At the same time, 
Uh, I've been discussing with you, this with you for a couple of weeks now, but the crisis around avian flu and uh, eggs and chicken have uh, you know started to really appear in the mainstream. Uh, we are seeing uh, you know retailers uh, rationing eggs. Apparently, some places you can't buy more than half a dozen eggs per person. Uh, we are likely to see price increases uh, you know come true with the chicken and eggs, and that's obviously going to be massively impactful in the country. Uh, eggs and chicken, you know, combined a huge percentage of uh, South Africa's protein needs are provided by those, uh, you know, uh, two commodities. Uh, high oil prices, high petrol prices, high food prices, you know, really a difficult time. Now, the oil prices, like I said, come down. And this, I think, is, is a key um, test of, of the market at the moment. Why? OPEC wants prices to be higher. One of the reasons you see things like the Naira uh, basically weaken is because, uh, you know, the oil price wasn't as strong as they would like it to be. Uh, high oil prices house places like Saudi Arabia, house places like, uh, you know, Venezuela, house places like Nigeria and Russia especially. Uh, because, you know, the Russians have been under sanctions and they basically have to sell that oil at a significant discount. If that oil price is higher, that discount would to a certain extent uh, be less painful. Uh, of course, there is a cap on the Russian oil price, but trust me, if oil prices are well above 100 and something dollars a barrel, uh, there's no way they're going to be settling for $60 when it comes to that oil that they have to sell. So, oil prices higher, egg food prices higher, inflation a big problem, meaning that we are likely to see uh, if the US Fed raises again, us having to follow you know, quite closely in South Africa as well. And finally, in terms of the major the mainstream news announcements, I want to deep dive into the situation in the US political system. So the U.S. has a weird system where they have to raise the amount of debt they, they can have as a government. It's not unlimited. It has to be set by, you know, the government has set out how much debt they can, they, can, they can have. And so periodically what happens, they are required to go out and have a vote to raise the debt ceiling. Now, if one party is in power uh, and one of the houses is held by another party, that minority party can play spoiler and stop vote going through and kind of have a government shutdown come into effect. And this one was happening in the last uh, week or so. We saw, uh, you know, uh, the Republicans, which uh, basically only control the Congress, uh, the Democrats control the Senate and the presidency, uh, basically pay spoiler, you know, trying to uh, not uh, increase the debt ceiling, which would mean that the government couldn't you know, spend as much as they needed to function, uh, which would be effectively a government shutdown. Now, uh, what happened was Kevin McCarthy was the uh, kind of the leader of the Congress, the Republicans, made a backroom deal with the Democrats. Basically, uh, negotiated a 45-day, uh, you know, extension effectively, uh, with the promise of uh, you know some leniency on things like Ukraine uh, down the low, down the right. Uh, this was seen as a betrayal of a deal he had made with the more extreme members of his own party. Uh, you know, which was in the last. Uh, uh, you know, in the last election for the speaker. Uh, he basically only won the speaker a position uh, after multiple, multiple votes. He was not um, an easy vote in. The reason being is that he has a very small ma majority in his party. And uh, his party has a very really small majority in the Congress. That means he needs basically everybody in his party to vote for him, for him to basically win the position of uh, speaker. If, that means a small number of people have uh, a disproportionate amount of power. And they use that power to, to basically extract some promises from him. Promises that he seems to have broken. Now, the person driving this particular thing was a guy called Matt Gates. Matt Gates has a controversial history. There's accusations about some really you know, disturbing things there. And nothing I think has been proven or anything like that. But he's a bit of an extremist in terms of his approach to uh, US politics. He put through a motion to vacate the speakership uh, for McCarthy, and then basically what happened was he won. I don't even think he thought he was going to win. I think he thought that a few Democrats would step across, support McCarthy, and then he would basically keep his position, but having kept his position with the support of Democrats, which would weaken him dramatically with his own party. The fact that uh, you know, they, they won and they got him kicked out uh, may have not been the ideal outcome for these guys, because uh, if he had stayed in power but with some Democratic support, uh, there'd be no major actual, you know, uh, problems with uh, the uh, government, etc. Uh, these guys that are on the extremist end could have basically kept up their, you know, p 
position up and saying, hey, we, we don't support this, that, and the other, but we have no, you know, we are fighting the, the good fight against these evil, you know, corporatists, etc. And, you know, not actually have that negative impact that would have affected them negatively in the polls. Now that they've actually won, uh, it's quite possible that there is going to be a government shutdown, which would be negative for Americans and be viewed negatively by Americans, which might hurt them in the polls. So this is an important uh, thing that happens. Also remember, I told you that the debt ceiling uh, was not you know, raised indefinitely. It was raised for 45 days, less than that now. You know, it's a few days have passed. So in the next 40 days or so, we need to have a new Speaker of the House elected. Remember I told you that the, this Kirk McCarthy guy, it took multiple votes to get him elected? Going to get a new speaker elected. That speaker has to go out and make a, a deal with the Democrats that somehow basically gets something through the uh, the U.S. Congress, etc., that gives the U.S. the ability to go borrow more money to go and spend what it needs to spend to function. That is a very tight deadline. Forty days is not that lot, uh, a lot of time when it comes to these kind of things. And I can easily foresee something really stupid happening. Now the U.S. doesn't have. There's no fundamental reason the U.S. could ever default on its debt. Why? Because it borrows in dollars and it prints its own dollars. There's no possible way that the U.S. can default on its debt except if they somehow act in an incredibly stupid manner. And one of the ways in acting in an incredibly stupid manner is by not having any leader in charge that takes responsibility for what's happening. And right now, that's the exact situation that they have in the U.S. There's nobody in charge to take responsibility for what's happening, and therefore it's quite possible that we are going to be seeing... Um, the closest we ever come to for the U.S. to basically default on its debt within the next month or so. So that is the, the U.S. debt ceiling. And now to our AI segment. Uh, GPT-4 had some improvements announced over the last week or so. Effectively, it now has the ability to hear and see. Especially the ability to see is really important. What does that do? Well, the kind of things that they've shown us are amazing. Like now, you thought GPT has the ability to see what can it do? How would you basically, you know, uh, improve the offering that it has at the moment by the ability to see? People thought, okay, but I thought the same thing, you know, uh, identify things. Take a picture of a plant, what is this plant? Take a picture of a mole on your arm, is this cancer? Take a picture of an x-ray, what's happening here? That kind of stuff. Well, yeah, that's true. But remember, GPT-4 can also write code as well. And so I've seen uh, applications in the last couple of days where people have made a whiteboard kind of an outline of what a computer program should look like or a website should look like. Starting like, for instance, uh, ask the person their age. If it's over 18, go to the site. If it's under 18, push them to this particular part of it as the children's part of the site. You show the whiteboard, uh, you know, draw outline of what you want to this uh, to GPT-4. It'll write the program that does it, the code that does it. How about uh, you look at a program like a like a, 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 a the front end of a app, for instance, in uh, and you say, I want to replicate that. GPT-4 can do that. Just to get the front end of an app, it can basically do a lot of behind-the-scenes code that allows that app to function. This is, I think, beyond the level that most people thought it could be you know, used for. Uh, like I said, people are thinking maybe identify like moles, identify uh, you know, diseases, identify you know, animals and plants, and that kind of stuff. Very few people thought you can give it instructions and have it basically perform you know, computer programming to basically give you a, a a program on almost no, uh, you know, uh, input or no, no it's called sophisticated input. Uh, this is a, a step beyond what I think most people foresaw at this point in time. And remember, GPT-4 is going to be obsolete probably in the next two months. By December this year, we have Gemini. Next year, we're probably going to get GPT-5 sometime in that year. GPT-5, if it follows the same pattern as, you know, three, or four to three and three to two, it's probably going to be at least 10 times more powerful than four. And this is what four can do right now. You can write a outline of a program you want on a whiteboard, and it can write the program language behind the scenes for you. It can basically take a picture of a bunch of street signs and tell you whether or not you can park there legally at this current time. It can basically go out, and recently we've seen uh, you know many examples of this here. You know, deceive people in terms of lie to them about things in order to achieve goals of the of the prompt that it has out there. It remains to be seen what a 10 times increase in power can do for this program. But it definitely is an interesting thing to look at. And before I go, there's one final little thing I want to put out there. Uh, Amazon has gotten into the whole, uh, you know, AI space, uh, acquisition space anyway, by putting, uh, you know, a few billion dollars to a company called Anthropic. Uh, Anthropic is founded by people that are quite... Uh, 
you know, those senior in the industry, uh, former open AI people, former deep mind people were involved in it. Uh, they got a program called Claude that they are creating. And the funding that they are getting at the moment uh, is basically, you know, the multiple billions. I mean, there's no clear indication right now what the market cap of the company is in, you know, uh, uh, implied to be by the uh, funding levels at the moment, uh, but it's likely to be in the multiple, multiple billions. And speaking of which, OpenAI has recently come out uh, with a sort of funding that I think placed them around about the $90 billion level in terms of uh, you know valuations. And I think the AI space right now, uh, though you know kind of it's, it's down up in the mainstream, the amount of new developments coming through have been really incredible, both on the side of capability and on the side of investments. And I truly expect to be seeing uh, some serious you know mainstream effects occurring in the next, say, six months or so. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for having me and uh, enjoy your weekend. Cheers.